Internet. Good morning, Internet. Good morning, uh, WMKG TV 38, if you're there. Appreciate you tuning in. Thank you, Kurt, for getting the door. And do you have your radio? Yes, I do. All right, we're going to go live on uh, K Rock right now. Good morning, 94.1 K Rock. This is Steve Bazin coming at you live in the studios in Ludington, Michigan this morning. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in. This program is being brought to you by your friends at the James Street Church of Christ. We're located at 219 South James Street, downtown Ludington, Michigan, 49431. And we also have a new congregation that assembles and meets together every Lord's Day, uh, 4 p.m. for Bible study, 5 p.m. for church worship, and that's in Muskegon, Michigan, 1451 East Broadway Avenue, uh, Muskegon, Michigan, 49444. Again, that's 1451 East Broadway Avenue, Muskegon, Michigan, 49444. And let me throw you my cell number real quick. You can jot this down if you'd like. It's 231-425-6044. Again, it's 231-425-6044. But this morning, we're coming to you live. And it's good to be back in the studios here with the V-Man, with Curdy V. And it's good to be back. Last week, we had a pre-recorded uh, DVD that we played for you over the air. And we actually got some good responses from that DVD. But this morning, you have an opportunity to call us live on air. And let me give you the phone number here to the radio station. It's area code 231-425-4280. Again, that's 231-425-4280. Friends, this is a religious program. We talk about religion. We talk about Christianity. We talk about all sorts of things religiously oriented. And, uh, Kurt? I'm going to let the viewers know we're not going to be able to have our verses up and stuff real quick. Oh, that, thank you, Kurt. That's right. Good, good, good observation. Uh, we've, we've got some technical difficulties where we are able to get our program going out on the radio. It is going out on the Internet. It is going out on TV. But uh, there's only one segment of the program that's going out. We don't have the scriptures available to post and put up for those who want to see them uh, on, on TV and on the Internet. Th thanks for that, Kurt. So let's get back to the topic at hand. Let's get back to what we're doing here. We're unlike everybody else in this community or even that I've ever seen uh, on, on air as far as this aspect goes. We take your calls live on the spot, on the air right now. We deal with what we're saying. We deal with what we're preaching. We deal with what we're teaching and preaching and what we believe. We can go to the Bible. We can show it. We can illustrate it. We, we can help you to see it. Now, here's a couple of the ways we're different. Number one, we always give you what the Bible says. We don't give you what we think. We don't give you what we feel, our opinions. We don't give you some holy hunch. We don't give you some godly guess. We don't tell you some mystical thing that God whispered to us in our dream last night. We're going to tell you what the Bible says. Now, a lot of people make that claim that they're a Bible-based church. But when it comes right down to it, they fail and they lack in many areas. And we want to be held to the test. We want you to call us if you think we're off on something. So we offer this live call-in program. You can call me live and put me on the spot right now with anything, and I welcome the call. I welcome it. You know, give me a call. Let's just see. You won't offend me in the least. You won't make me upset. Let's, give it, let's talk about things, especially, friends, if we're in disagreement about something. The Bible says, Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reason, saith the King of Jacob. In Jude chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible there says that we are to earnestly contend for the faith. In 1 Peter chapter 4, the Bible says that we're to be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh us uh, of the reason of the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear. The, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible there says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We should be able to put each other to the test. We should be able to ask each other questions. We should be able to take whatever it is that we're not understanding or perhaps that we're in disagreement with. We should be able to take those things and use those things to our benefit. We should be able to grow and come together because the Bible has an answer to those things. And if we go to the Bible and we just let the Bible speak to us with an honest, open heart, whatever the Bible says, that's what we should agree to do. And that's why we are so willing to come on the air live and come at you and talk to you and put ourselves out here like this because we are the kind of people that want to exhibit an earnestness when it comes to dealing with the Word of God. We 
are different than everyone else who is out there because we mean what we say, we say what we mean, we try to be as honest as humanly possible, we will be, we are, and we're wide open. We're an open case. We're not hiding anything. We don't say one thing behind closed doors and another thing in public. We are what we are, and we are the body of Christ. We are the church of Christ. In Romans chapter 16, 16, there the Bible says, the churches of Christ salute you. And that's who we are. That's what we are. And we don't charge anybody. We're not on, we're not on the radio. You've never heard us selling anything. You've never heard us begging or, or trying to borrow money. That's not what this is about. In fact, we offer you free material. We, we, you give us a call, we'll send you free uh, tracks, we'll send you free DVDs. I'll meet with you if you're a lady. My wife and I will do our best to come together. We'll meet with you. If you're a man, I'll meet with you. We'll sit down, we'll have a talk. If you don't have a Bible, I'll bring a Bible, I'll give you a Bible. We're not charging, we're not asking for anything. With all those things being said, let me give you our phone number one more time. It's 231-425-4280. That's 231-425-4280. 4280 and you can call us live on the air but right now let me I, he I heard this on the radio this morning as I was driving into the radio station here a comment and uh, the comment was something like this for those of you who have said that prayer and are believers for you this guy says I want you to call me and I, I want to talk to you well, you know and he says that's all you have to do by the way is just say that prayer and you know what? I have the same exact sentiment this morning. For those of you who have said that prayer, and what he's talking about is the sinner's prayer. He's talking about this doctrine that the world has, that all you have to do is say a prayer to the Lord and ask Him into your heart, and confess you're a sinner, confess in your heart and in your prayer that you're a believer, and then whammo, bammo, zappo, you're automatically prayed, at, uh, excuse me, you're, you're, autom you're automatically saved at that point. Now, for those of you who have said that prayer, I'm interested as well. Can you call me? I would like to talk to you as well. And something that is very, very, very foreign to the Bible, something that eludes the Bible, something that's not in the Bible, something that's added to the Bible, however, is this very idea of saying the sinner's prayer. It is not in the Bible. So, when you call, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you, Please tell me where that sinner's prayer is in the Bible, because I certainly would like to read that, and I would like to say that myself. And if it's not in the Bible, however, if it is not there, then please consider where you're getting that from. If it's not in the Bible, it must be man-made, it must be man-concocted, it must be a tradition or a commandment of men. Notice what Matthew chapter 15, verse 9 says, there Jesus would say, uh, uh, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, I want you to let that sink deep. If the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible, where did it come from? If it didn't come from the Bible, then it did not come from God. If it didn't come from God, then it came from man. And ultimately, it came from the devil, it came from Satan, because it is a false concept. It is something that's causing people to think in a wrong way. Now let me explain that a little bit. Steve, are you saying that it's wrong for us to believe? Absolutely not. No. Belief is essential. We must all believe, there's no doubt. But it's not at the point of belief that we're saved. And it's not at the point of saying some prayer that we're saved. The alien sinner or those outside of Christ cannot be saved by simply believing or saying a prayer or those two things together. The Bible does not teach that. There is no sinner's prayer in the Bible. And so therefore, if it's not in the Bible, it came from man. If it comes from man, then it is something vain and it is something wrong. And if there is more that's required, friends, now watch this carefully. If there is more that, that, that is required other than just accepting and saying a prayer and believing, but they have you thinking that you're saved at that point, then they have actually harmed you and done you great hurt and harm. Why? Because you think you're saved when you're not. 
You think, all right, I've got it now. I'm a Christian. I'm saved. But you're truly not. Paul, oh, no. You have, in Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2 there, Isaiah would say that your sins have separated you from your God. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23 there, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Sin is what separates mankind from God. The problem we have in our lives is sin. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. We have a sin problem. Now, we have to get rid of the sin. How does that happen? That's the question. Does the sinner's prayer that you can't even find in the Bible, is that what gets rid of the sin? Now, if you can't even find it in the Bible, and sin's the problem, we've got to get rid of the sin, and you can't find where we're saying that some prayer is what alleviates or, or remits or gets rid of that sin, then obviously, saying the sinner's prayer isn't fixing the problem that you have in your life with God. And the problem, again, is sin. Now, the Bible tells us what gets... What, what, what it is that gets rid of sin. The Bible tells, tells us what that is. Right, what am I going to do with Kurt? Um, <laughs> uh, forgive me. Uh, give me just a second here. The Bible teaches us that we must believe. But the Bible also teaches us that we must repent. In Luke chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus will say, Yea, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And he repeats it again in verse 5. Nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Repentance is absolutely necessary. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, there the Bible says, For the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Repentance is an absolute necessary thing before we can be saved. You know what that means? We have to stop committing the sins that we're committing we have to stop doing that, and we have to start doing what God wants us to do. That's repentance. A change of heart, which leads to a change of mind, which leads to a change of action. That's true repentance. Now, I don't know of anybody out there who claims to be a Christian who will say that they don't need to repent. But then at the exact same time, they'll turn around and say, we don't have to do anything. Or they'll say, all you have to do is believe. And every time I ask, friends, call me. The number here is 231-425-4280. It's 231-425-4280. If you believe that you can be saved without repentance, I'd like to talk to you this morning. If you believe all you have to do is say the sinner's prayer or just accept Jesus in your heart, I would like for you to produce that verse, please. But we're going to look at it in whatever verse it is in its proper context. We're going to make proper application to it. We're going to look at everything involved with that verse, and we're going to see exactly what's what with it. Now watch this. On the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, in verse 37, we find there believers. We find believers there in verse 37. In fact, the Bible says they believed to the degree that they were pricked or cut in their heart. That's how vehemently these people believed. They believed God sent his son, his son was Jesus Christ, they crucified him, he rose from the dead the third day, he's now reigning as Lord of Lords and King of Kings, he is the Messiah, he is the Christ, he is the Savior. They believed in that and they, were, they believed it in their hearts to the degree that they were pricked or cut there. Now here we have believers, and, but they have the most astounding and most important question ever asked anyone in the world. Anybody, any, any question that could ever be asked, here it is, the most important question could ever be asked ever in the world is, what must I do to be saved? Please tell me, what must I do to be saved? Please tell me what I need to do to get right with God. Now, Peter said to them, these believers now, they believed in the heart, they were cut to the heart, they were pricked in the heart, they believed in Christ. Then they said, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Now, it is sin that it separates you from God. It is sin you have to get rid of. And belief is an important part of that. It precedes repentance. It, pre it precedes baptism. But baptism is the key element that will ultimately wash your sins away. You don't believe that, do you? I know you don't. You won't call me, you won't talk to me about it, but you don't believe it. 
But that's exactly what the Bible says. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2.38. But now watch this. In Acts chapter 22, we find the story of the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul was called Saul before he was renamed Paul. And while he was Saul, he was a great persecutor of the church. And he was going to Damascus to persecute the Christians. And a bright light shone round about him, and he fell to the ground. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And here, Saul of Tarsus asked the same question, What should you, shall you have me do, Lord? He recognized now that Jesus Christ is for real. He is legitimate. He is the Son of God. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the Messiah. And now Saul of Tarsus is a vehement believer. In fact, he is the most staunch believer we can read about in all the Bible. He wrote half of the New Testament, and he believed, Lord, what would you have me to do? Now, the Bible says, the Bible says that Jesus told him that he was to go into Damascus to the street called Straight and wait there. He said, for it shall be told thee what thou must do. Now, we find there, though, that Saul's a believer already. But yet he's not saved. He's not saved yet. In fact, we find the Bible teaching us that when he rose from up from the ground, from that blinding light, that he was literally blind, and his companions who were there with him had to lead him by the hand and take him to that house, which was on Straight Street. And there he was for three days and for three nights, the Bible says, and he fasted for three days and three nights. Neither did he eat or drink one thing. The Bible says he prayed for three days and for three nights. The Bible says that Saul repented. He was a believer. He was praying. He had repented. He was fasting. But Jesus told Ananias to go to Saul. He said, For behold, he prayeth. He is a chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles, Jesus told Ananias. Ananias said, Lord, I've heard much of this man. He's done much harm and hurt to Christians, and I'm scared to go to him. And Jesus said, Go thy way. He's a chosen vessel. You go, you help Saul. So when Ananias got to Saul, Saul was a believer. Saul was a prayer. Saul was a repentant, believing, prayerful individual. And you know what Ananias told him in Acts chapter 22, verse 16? He said, Why tarriest thou? What are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Wash away thy sins in baptism is what that's saying there. Why tarriest thou? What are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Baptism is what gets our sins removed. It's what is ultimately responsible for the remission of sins. That's at the point you're saved. You're not saved while you still have your sins. You are still a spotted, dirty rag. You still have sin in your life. And God will not dwell with sin. You are not in the body of Christ. You cannot be with spot and blemish and be in the body of Jesus Christ. You have to have those spots and blemishes clean. Which is exactly why Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, Baptism doth also now save us. Now friends, Many, 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 many other passages can we go to. But now let's shift gears for just a moment here. Let's go back to this idea of believers for just a moment, actually. In John chapter 1, <coughs> excuse me, in John chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Did you catch that, friends? Now, here's one of the most quoted verses in all the Bible. It's one of them. It's got a, I'm, I'm guessing it's in the top ten. Now, listen to it carefully, though. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you have received Jesus Christ, if you believe on his name, now you have the power to become a son of God. 
Just because you've received them and just because you believe in them doesn't mean you are a son of God. It means now you have the essential, fundamental, basic elements to become a son of God. That verse does not say you're a Christian and you're cleansed at that point. It does not say that. It says you have the power not to become the sons of God. It's exactly what Jesus would say in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature under heaven. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. If you believe, now you have the power to become the sons of God. Well, how do you become the sons of God? You've got to get your sins removed. How do you do that? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. That's a direct quote of Jesus Christ from Mark, who wrote the book of Mark, who was inspired of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy chapter two, uh, 3, verse 16. Listen, friends, this isn't difficult and it's not hard. The problem is we have all these people running around telling you things that just are not in the Bible. You're going to hear them saying things like this. You don't have to do anything. Mm, no. Jesus did it all for you. You don't have to do anything at all. Now, friends, think about that for a minute. Please think about that for just one minute. If we don't have to do anything, then we have universal salvation. Then everybody in the world is saved right now. If there's nothing, if there's absolutely zero, if there's nothing we are to do, Jesus did it all for us. Jesus came and gave his life for the entire world now. If that's the way that is, then the whole world is saved. Now you've got atheists in heaven. You've got devil-loving worshipers, evil, wicked people in heaven. You have Muslims in heaven. You have Jews in heaven. These people don't believe in the risen Christ. If you don't have to do anything, but, but you see, they don't stop there. They confuse the matter. You don't have to do anything. Jesus did all for you. All you have to do is pray, or all you have to do is accept. Now wait a minute. Now wait just a minute. I may not be the most educated man in the world, but friends, I learned simple arithmetic in kindergarten or first grade. If you don't have to do anything, but then you turn around and you have to believe or you have to pray, then I'm smart enough to see that if you have a couple of things there, then there's a couple of things there you got to do. And it's not nothing. <laughs> if that, I know that doesn't sound like proper English, but it, when they say you don't have to do anything, then they turn right around and they're, they're contradicting themselves and they're confusing things. And people are, you've heard it so much. You hear it so often. A lie that's repeated over and over and over and over is far more easily to be believed than something you've never heard before. Now these people are telling you you don't have to do anything, but all you have to do now is believe and, and set up prayer. Well, you know what? Maybe the concept that you don't have to do anything is wrong. Have you ever thought about that? In fact, I'm going to say it is wrong. In Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2, verse 40, the Bible there says, Save yourselves from this untoward or crooked generation. Oh, there is something that you have to do. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Jesus said, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. I'm going to go and I'm going to listen to Jesus every night. Jesus said, You must be born again. In John chapter 6, verse 28-29, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus told him, believe, for this is the work of God. Even believing is a work. Even believing is doing something. Now, we had the believers in Acts 2.37. They were cut in their heart. They believed. And yet they still had to do something. They had to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. Friends, Saul, Saul was a believer. He prayed for three days and for three nights. He was repentant. He still had to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins. Friends, 
In James chapter 2, the Bible there says, The devils believe and tremble. Now, if all you have to do is believe, <coughs> excuse me, if all you have to do is believe, then now you've got the devils in heaven. That's ridiculous. All right, let's shift gears for a minute. I know there's people listening to this radio program that are somewhat confused this morning, but I want you to understand this. God is not the author of confusion. The reason folks are confused this morning, listening to this message and listening to this program, is because all the pastors in this community and all these quote-unquote preachers around here and teachers have taught damnable, heretical, diabolical, de demonic teachings that they proclaim to be Christian teachings for so long that you've accepted it and you've believed it and now you think it's true, but it's not. And so now when you hear me coming on saying that the Bible does tell you to do something, and it does in many, 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 many places, you must, must save yourselves. You've got to do something. Now you hear that and you're all confused. And it's not the Bible's fault. It's these false teachers who have taught this for so long. It's their fault. And when it comes right down to it, it's your fault for not double-checking, for not being careful. You know, we can, go to any, we can go to almost anywhere in the Bible and set forth almost anything in the world that we want to set forth. We, we can almost promote anything. All we have to do is go find any wording or any verse in the Bible, and we pull it out of its context, and we can misapply it, and we can make it say almost anything we want to. And that's exactly what these people do. They'll take certain verses and they'll remove it out of its natural and proper context. They'll misapply it. They'll misteach it. They'll take it out and they'll, they'll repeat it over and over and over to a degree that everybody now believes that that is it. But I want you to understand, we have to take all of the Bible. We can't take just certain verses and pull them out of the proper context and misapply them and think that that is what is being taught throughout the whole of the Bible. We cannot do that. When we read in the Bible in one place, baptism doth also now save us. And we read in another place where, for example, the Apostle Paul told the Philippian jailer, Believe in, in thy house, and thou shalt be saved. Now you read two verses later, and it says it took them the same hour of the night, and they were baptized. But when you read that one verse by itself, and you don't continue reading the rest of it, which is what these people do... They don't tell you they took the jailer the same hour of the night immediately after he did believe and they baptized him. And then after that, the rejoicing came. They don't tell you that. They just take that one phrase there. All you got to do is believe, they say, but that's not what the verse says. When we take all of what the Bible says, that's when we get all of the picture. That's when we can start seeing all of it. Now, friends, give me just a moment here. Listen to this. Tell me if this doesn't make sense. If the Bible says in one place that you must be born again, that you must be baptized, that baptism doth also now save us, and it says in another place that you've got to believe, and it says in another place that you've got to repent, and it says in another place that you've got to confess, doesn't it make sense that all those things are true? Doesn't that just make the most simplistic, easiest, fundamental way of understanding it is it cannot be wrong. It's coming from the Bible. It's got to all be true. Well, how does it work? You put it all together. <coughs> That's how it works. You put it all together. You don't separate them. You don't take a pair of scissors and cut out a part of it because you don't like it as much or you don't understand it or it's never been taught to you. When you find these truths, and it may be that you're listening to this program at this point in time, right this very moment, for a reason. And it may be you've had all the prior understanding and all the prior teachings and all the prior uh, uh, um, things that you understand that's gotten you to this point right now, that you're listening to this program, that you're starting to see it, and friends, don't let this moment go to waste. Grab hold of it and take it and give me a call. Let's talk about it. And let's just let the Bible tell us everything it wants to tell us. 
let's not just take bits and pieces of it and, and think and believe that now we have it in its entirety and we have no worries. Oh, friends, that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. Jesus, when tempted by the devil, would always say, it is written again. There's more to it. That's what we're telling you this morning. There's more to it than what you've heard your whole lives. Take this opportunity, please. Go ahead, Kurt. Well, I uh, would like to share the fact that being knowledgeable with the Bible doesn't necessarily completely save you. You might have the knowledge that faith only is okay, and that's part of it, but that's not the full knowledge. You need to be able to divide it properly. You need to be wise. Wisdom comes by understanding knowledge. Read Proverbs 23, 23. That'll help you. Instruction. You have to have instruction. Somebody that is a teacher and knows this stuff, you need to really take heed and investigate it for yourself and say, hey, I'm being taught wrong. I, I, need, to have, I need to have a Bible study. Uh, that's, that's what you need to do. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says the full of uh, uh, full duty of man is to fear God and obey all His commandments. That's not that's not verbatim, but that's Ecclesiastes 12:13 will uh, help you see some of that. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 28 says, "For precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little." Friends, precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. We just can't take one idea, one precept, one concept, and think that that's it. We, there's more to it. We have to take it all. We have to put it all together, and it's got to fit without contradiction. Go ahead, Kurt. Okay. Well, I remember, I remember talking to my dad, and uh, you brought this verse up to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, man, it hit him like a ton of bricks. Precept upon precept, folks. That just because faith, believe, hearing, believing, faith, and being baptized, repentance, and all that isn't all in one location, does not mean that we don't follow those things. It's precept upon precept, line upon line. That, that's what's be, being taught here. Let's so look, let's approach this from a philosophical standpoint, uh, friends. Let, let, let's look at this from another whole angle. And I want you to, to understand this. If you doing absolutely nothing would save you, then Jesus made a great mistake when he told his disciples to go teach all nations everything that he had taught them and you take that all the way to the end of the world. It would have been far better for Jesus to say, let's keep this thing a secret, Let's keep it to ourselves. Let's not write it down. Let's, let's, let's hide it. Let's bury it. Let's keep the Word of God in silence because if people don't have to do anything, they don't have to do anything, then it would be better for them not to hear it and, and just get part of it or some of it. You can see that, friends. This, this thing is not that difficult. The, the difficulty comes when we let when we let our hearts rule over our minds. Now our heart must be a part of it, but our mind must be the leader in the race, so to say. What we learn, what we understand, what we know, what we know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We can go to the Word of God and we can know what God wants. And then we let our hearts follow that. We don't let our heart. We don't let our mind follow our hearts. So, so whenever we look at these things together, we need to take God's truths. Jesus would say, "Sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy word is truth." We need to take the truths of the Bible and hold that at a premium. That's the most important thing in our in our lives. You know, your feelings will get you in trouble. Oh yeah, a lot of people feel like they just got to get drunk. They feel it so vehemently. But their mind is telling them this is wrong. Their mind is saying, I shouldn't be doing this. Their mind is saying, I can't afford it. Their mind is saying, if, if, I, if I'm a drunkard, I can't be saved. If I get drunk, I get sick. If I get drunk, I, I, I act like an idiot. If I get drunk, I, I get a car ticket. But their feelings want it so bad, they do it anyway. And they allow their, their heart or their feelings to overrule 
what they know, and that is not Christian. That's the opposite of Christianity. Christian behavior and Christ-like attributes is always doing the greatest and best and highest good that you can. Moral excellence, which is a uh, virtue, is another word for moral excellence. Be virtuous. We can know the truth, and the truth can set us free. The Bible nowhere says, just go by your feelings and whatever you feel in your heart. Nowhere does it say that. But that's what these people tell you. Oh, it's okay, you can do it this way as long as you really feel it. Well, you know what they got you being? They got you being your own God. They got you saying, as long as you determine it, that's the way it's going to be, and it's all good. But that's not the truth. God is the one who determines our salvation. He is the one who tells us who and how and what we must be in our lives. If it was up to the individuals, then the atheists would have nothing to worry about. The Jews would have nothing to worry about. Jesus should have never said, go preach the gospel to every creature under heaven. If it was up to every individual cre uh, creature to do what he wanted to do to be saved, he'd say, go out and tell them to do whatever they want to do. Just go by their feelings. Don't give them the gospel. But friends, Jesus did not say that. He said in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, All authority or all power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. Christianity is a taught religion. You must be taught Christianity. That's how it gets into your heart. When you see it and you understand it and you know it's God's truth, you let it get in your heart and permeate your heart. And your heart follows what your mind says is right. And you can understand it. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. Listen to what the Apostle Paul would say in the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Beginning verse 1. I'll just start at Ephesians 3, 1. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says here. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, Paul saying, now listen, I've got, I've got this dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, but it, it has to go to you too, is what he's saying there. Listen to verse 3. How that by revelation he that is God made known unto me, that is Paul, the mystery as I wrote afore in few words. Paul said, God revealed the mystery to me. I have it. Now watch what he says in verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 3. He says, Whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The Bible is meant to be understood. People today say you can't understand it. They're lying to you. They're wrong. Paul said, when you read it, you can understand it. And if we can understand it, why isn't it that we let, we, why don't we let that understanding guide us in our ways instead of some feelings that we get that's contrary to or contradictory to the words of God that we can't understand? I'll tell you why. Here's exactly why. It's a lot easier and it's a lot more comforting for you just to sit back and think that you're okay than to go through and put some time and effort into the Bible and find now you're not okay. And you may have to change some things in your lives. And you may have to do some things. Some things that maybe you've never heard before. Some things maybe you've never considered before. Some things maybe you've never really thought through all the way before. These things are real. They are as real as believing is. As Jesus is. In John 12, verse 48, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words has one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. The words of Jesus Christ is real. They're there, and it's the word of God that's going to judge us in the last day. And if the word of God says you can't understand the word, and if the word of God says you must do what it tells you to do, and be what it tells you to be, and act like it tells you to act, walk as it tells you to walk, Love as you're supposed to love. All these wonderful things explained to us. And why can't we just do that? 
Do you know what that would cause? That would cause unity, and that would cause peace in this world. There would be, if everybody could just do that, there would be no need for me to come on the right. You'd already have it, because everybody would already be preaching and teaching the same thing. And by the way, the Bible doesn't bring different verses, or different doctrines, different gospels. It brings one gospel. It brings one doctrine. The phone number here is 231-425-4280. Again, it's 231-425-4280 is the number here this morning. Now, while we're talking about this, let's bring up another whole concept. What is church? What is it? And, and I think that's a good question. Have you really asked yourself, what is church, or what is it supposed to be? Do you think that maybe God has something to do with it? Or do you think it's just something that people put together just so that they can try to come together under the guise of some social network whereby we can all sort of affiliate with one another or, you know, be some kind of a social club. What is church? Where did it come from? Do you think maybe God wanted it to be here? And if God wanted it to be here, do you think maybe he had a hand in building or making it? Do you think maybe he has told us how we could become a part of it? Do you think maybe, just maybe, just, you know, by some wild circumstantial evidence, do you think possibly that perhaps and maybe God tells us what to do when we get into the church, after we get into it? Friends, you don't have to wonder these things. The Bible helps us to understand these things. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. That's what Jesus came here to do. The church has been in existence in the mind of God, in the mind of the Lord, from eternity. In Ephesians chapter 3, the Bible says there that the church was the eternal purpose of God. The eternal purpose. When the Bible said in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Even then, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost knew the church had to come into existence. The church had to be here. God's eternal purpose was to bring forth the church. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 11 through 12 teaches us that. And Jesus said, I will build my church. It's Jesus. He built it. And that's chapter 20, verse 28. The Bible there says, that he gave his blood for it. It's blood bought. It's an important thing. A lot of people look at church and they think it's some building. They think it's the beautiful stained glass. They think it's the, the, the aura or, or maybe the incense that's burning inside. The beautiful man, manicured lawn. Maybe the nice little steeple with a, with a bell, a church bell in it. Or, and they get this picturesque type of idea in their head about what church is. That's not church. The church is a spiritual institution which consists of those who are saved and God is the one who adds people to his church and he does it when they're baptized. Say that again, Steve. You are not in God's church until you are baptized. Steve, I've never heard that before. I know that. That's why I'm telling it to you. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, those believers there, Peter told them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Three verses later, verse 41, the Bible there says, And as many as uh, uh, received the words, as, uh, uh, you know what, my mind eludes me, as many, uh, the Bible there says that um, they, they that gladly received, they that gladly received the word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Did you get that? They that gladly received the word. What was the word? Repent and be baptized. Then that gladly received it, the Bible says, that day 3,000 people received that message and were baptized. And the Bible says, they, those who were baptized, were added unto them, those who were saved, the apostles. A few verses later, in Acts 2.47, the Bible says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. 
Jesus came to build his church. He gave his blood for it. And whoever's being saved, God puts them in it. But he doesn't put them in it until they're baptized into it. Know you not that so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Romans chapter 6 verse 3 tells us. Galatians 3.27 says, Whosoever of us have been baptized into Jesus Christ have put on Christ. Baptism is what puts us into Christ. Now, when you're in Christ, you're in his body. And when you're in his body, you're in his church. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, the Bible says, And hath given him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. So, let's go back. Let's think about this. What is church? What is it? It's not the stained glass windows. It's not a social club. You know, it's not somewhere... I, I've had people tell me, Steve, I go to this church because my dentist goes there and my auto mechanic goes there. And, and the guy I rent my house from, he goes to this church, and I get a discount. Every time I go to the auto mechanics, uh, every time my car needs worked on, I get a 10% discount because I go to church with the guy. You know, they've reduced the church to nothing more than money, nothing more than materialistic greed. They've reduced it to a mere social club, a social standing. Oh, I go here because the mayor goes here. And you think that makes you look better? You think if the mayor went to uh, the house of Satan, would you go there too? Would you follow him? Well, what about your car mechanic? It's not the beautiful imagery of some uh, building. It's not some social club. It's not those things. The Apostle Paul would say in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. The church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. That's what the church is. It's a spiritual institution that God puts all the saved into it. And it's the institution that's preaching and teaching the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now here's the question. Would God add you to some church that's not preaching and teaching the truth? Bam! If you're going to some church that's saying all you have to do is believe, or all you have to do is say the sinner's prayer, and baptism has nothing to do with it, then that is not the truth and that is not the church and you're not a part of it. Kurt, well, based on that particular philosophy, then they are commending themselves based on their own belief. In uh, 2 Corinthians 10.18, it, it says, Not he that commendeth himself, but who God commendeth. Yeah, not he that, that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Yeah. Yes, thank you. It's all right. Yeah, very good. That's exactly right. That is exactly, that is exactly right. Now, watch this, folks. God wants you to be able to identify His church. Did you know that? Now, just because it's a spiritual institution, He wants you to identify it. One of the first things He said, and I've hit this in programs past. I'm going to touch on it just briefly, and I'm going to move off of it. If somebody wants to call me about it, that's fine. Phone number here is 231-425-4280. Again, that's 231-425-4280. But the Bible actually calls the church by name. In Romans chapter 16, verse 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Now watch this. The Bible says in Romans 14, 23, and whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If it's not in the Word of God, then it's sin. And please tell me where you get your denominational names for your churches from. It's not in the Bible. Whatsoever is not a faith is sin. But guess what? The church that Jesus said, I will build, that's in the Bible. What? The churches of Christ salute you. Now watch this. The church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. 
God wants you to recognize His church. And if you have read your Bible with an honest, open heart, and you've really investigated and you've really looked at it, you're going to find that baptism is essential, and it's at the point of baptism that God puts you into His church, into His body. And if you're going to some church that says it's not needed and it's not necessary, and you don't have to do anything about it, about being baptized, well then, you know that's not the church of the Bible, because that's not the truth. And the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. Good morning, caller. You're on live with Steve. Hi, Steve. This is Brenda. Well, good morning, Brenda. How are you doing today? Oh, I am doing wonderful. I'm sitting here enjoying your program on your baptism. Oh, wow. And um, I have to fully agree with you that baptism is very important in our lives. Um, I could say I made a vow to the Lord about seven years ago to get baptized, but it never happened. But it will happen soon. But I want to run across this. I want to run this verse across to you that put it on my heart to make me believe that we must be born of water. Okay. Okay. Um, in John three mm -hmm. five, Jesus answered them, and he says, "I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit." Okay. The Lord put that on my heart, and I knew seven years ago when I changed my life. I know I want to be fully submerged to get rid of these old dirty rags out of my body so yeah. I can be, be born again. But he also tells us, uh, Jesus also says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Yep. Okay, so to me, born again, we must be born by water and spirit. Amen. That, that, that's exactly right, Brenda. That's exactly yeah. correct. And I'm, yeah. I'm really glad you called. The, the radio program this morning, and, and, I, and I, want, I want to say this. I commend you because you're an honest, open person who is seeking to do what the Bible says do. And you know what? You're not even afraid to call in and, and talk to us on air live this morning. A lot of folks, uh, you know, that disagree or even agree, a lot of folks just don't want to call. But we appreciate you calling this morning. Thank you very much. You're welcome, and I, I truly, I'm truly with you all the way. There is only one God, one word, and no, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a prophet, but I do, I did seek His word diligently, and I do read His words, yep. and I take them to heart, and and I only go by what He tells me. And if another person comes to me and says, "This is this is the way it is," well, can you show me in the Bible where it says this? Because I want it to come strictly from His Word. That's exactly yeah. the attitude and, and the mind we should have. I, I, we all appreciate that. That's thank wonderful. you so much. Yeah. yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Brenda. Anything else you wanted to say, real quick, or? Um, no, I'm just. I am grateful that you are teaching on baptism because. There are people who believe, because in Romans 10 it does tell you if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, um, that you shall be saved, but you got to read the full verses, like you said, before and after, because right. Jesus replied and says you must be born of water and, and, and spirit. That's so. right. Very good. Pre appreciate that, Brenda. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to getting to know you and meet you uh, more in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, good call. That's exactly right. And, uh, you know, she, she made reference there to John chapter 3, verses 3 uh, through 5 there. It's hard to miss. And by the way, now watch this, folks. I had a couple things on my mind here. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16. You know who Jesus is talking to there? He's talking to Nicodemus. Now, who is Nicodemus? Nicodemus is the same one he told in John 3. Verses 3 through 5, you must be born again of the water and of the Spirit. Then later on he says, God sent his uh, uh, only begotten Son, whosoever believeth. And he told that man, you must be born again. Now watch this. In Ephesians chapter 5, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, the Bible there says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. <laughs> Bang! You want to talk about you must be born again of the water and of the Spirit? By the washing of water by the word. Now the Spirit is what brought the word to us. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We can read about that in First Peter. And here 
We know that the Spirit directs us by His Word, and it directs us to be baptized with the washing of water, and that's exactly what being born again is all about in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 6. There we can read that's where the newness of life comes from. It's through baptism. You must be born again. Now, let, let, me, take you to another, let me take you to another verse here in 1 Peter chapter 1. Let me, let me turn there in my Bible because I want to read it to you. In 1 Peter chapter 1, get over there real quick. I know we're running short on time, but this is good stuff, and I want to bring this to you. Verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit. Did you catch that? Now listen to this closely, friends. Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit. You must be born of the water and the Spirit. How does the Spirit work? Through obedience to the Word of God. The Spirit brings us the words of truth. Listen to me. Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The word of God directs us and tells us, uh, the Spirit brings the word to us, and it tells us we must be born of the water. And there are three that bear a record on earth. The, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. 1 John chapter 5, verse 8. The Apostle Peter would say, or excuse me, the Ethiopian eunuch would say, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Huh. The Apostle Peter would say, Can any man forbid water that these should be baptized, the same as we? Peter would say in 1 Peter 3.21, Talking about water, the lake figure run to baptism doth also now save us. And when any honest person goes to the Bible and reads a passage like John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, where it says you must be born of the water and of the Spirit, we can see, honestly, honestly we can see what this is talking about. It's talking about water baptism. In Matthew 28, when Jesus told his disciples, you go teach them and you baptize them. What kind of baptism can disciples give to people? Please answer that. Can a disciple baptize you with the Holy Spirit? No. No. Jesus is the only one that can do that. Matthew 3, John the Baptist says, Jesus is the one that will baptize with the Holy Ghost. But Jesus told his disciples, you go and you teach people and you baptize them. And that baptism was to go even unto the end of the world. That baptism must be water baptism. That's the only baptism that disciples can administer. I cannot administer Holy Spirit baptism. Neither can anybody else. Only Jesus can. But Jesus told us to go and baptize people. It's got to be the water. Good morning, caller. You're on live with Steve. Steve. Yes. Good morning, Brother Mark. Brother Mark, how are you doing this morning, Louisiana? Oh, great. Thank the Lord. Amen. Nine, nine. When Jesus told that blind man, he, when he fell on the ground, put the spit in his eyes to go wash in a pool of Siloam, because that blind man has been healed without going to that water. I want to see. Excellent. Excellent. Appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. What a call. Man, what a call. That, when Jesus, I don't know if everybody heard that on air. Sometimes we have problems with the phone. When Jesus told the blind man to go wash in the pool of Siloam, had the, did, that, did that blind man at that point in time believe that his eyes could be healed? Oh, yeah, I think he believed it. Were they healed at that point in time? Would his eyes have been healed if he never went to the pool of Siloam, to the water? No. If he hadn't have done that, he would have remained blind. Bang, what a call that is. That's what I'm talking about. To people that are honest, to people that just want to see what the Bible says. What about Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5? He had leprosy, and he went to the prophet of God, and the prophet of God told him, you go dip in the river Jordan uh, five times. He got all mad about it. But he finally did it. And he would have never been cleansed of his leprosy if he didn't go to the water and dip five times. Now today, we don't have to go to the River Jordan and we don't have to dip five times. We do it once. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. 
And it's just with water. See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And why tearest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling upon the Lord, name of the Lord. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And there's no other church in Ludington, Michigan, in Muskegon, Michigan, that I'm aware of. No other uh, church in West Michigan teaching and preaching the things that we are, and we invite you to come and be with us, because we preach and teach the truth straight from the Word of God, unlike anyone else. They're going to give it to you all mixed up. We meet at 219 South James Street, Ludington, Michigan at 10 and 11 a.m. We meet at 1451 East Broadway Avenue in Muskegon. It's 1451 East Broadway, Muskegon from 4 to 5. You're all welcome. You're all invited. My cell phone number is 231-425-6044. Again, my cell number is 231-425-6044. May God bless you. We love you. We care for you. And we love God and His truths. And that's what you're going to get when you're with us. We hope to hear from you. Hang on one second. We're still on air.